first case. Sure. All right, so this, as soon as it loads, this is an unfortunate young man. He's about mid 30s, or he, and he has severe pulmonary hypertension. And I don't know, I got photos here. Let's see. There we go. He has severe pulmonary hypertension and right heart failure, and has a CT that looks like this. So we see this soft tissue around the right hilum and then the mediastinum, a narrowed right pulmonary artery in its branches. If we look at the left atrium, you see it's very small. The inferior vein is out. The superior vein is out. The airway is narrowed. There's also some soft tissue around the left hilum. Uh, and we see dilation of the left pulmonary artery and then an occluded apical posterior segmental artery on the left. We've got pleural effusion. And if we switch over to the lung windows here, we can see a lot of mosaic attenuation on the left, very little aeration of the right lung. And then you see areas of increased attenuation with very large vessels, areas of decreased attenuation with very small vessels, and some septal lines. And um, so this guy, unfortunately, has, and then some collaterals, has developed fibrosing mediastinitis from histoplasmosis. You can see the calcifications here. And I know Dave is not on, but he's going to ask me about the spleen. And he does have a little punctate calcification in the spleen. And he's from this part of the country, so it makes sense. You can see the right heart is dilated, a little hypertrophied. There's bowing of the septum to the left. And so he was sent here to try to salvage what we could to reduce his strain on the right heart. But unfortunately, there was nothing to do. We can't open. They were unable to really, there was no more thing to really open to the extent, whether it's a vessel or something, to uh, decrease the right heart pressure. So all most of the cardiac output is going to the left lung. There's a little bit going to the right. And we're, because the veins are occluded, it's just mostly, the, that's accounting for the effusion and edema in that lung. So it wouldn't really help. Uh, so, and oh, there's David. Hey, David. So I'm showing this case of fibrosing mediastinitis. I thought you'd like uh, pulmonary severe pulmonary hypertension and core pulmonale, a 35-year-old who, who unfortunately succumbed to this. There was just a right heart failure, nothing, nothing really to do in these patients other than try to preserve any vascular perfusion you can. Um, but unless there's a, a vessel that's narrow that you can open, uh, there's really nothing to do. So he's got uh, fibrous tissue taking out uh, vessels, arteries, and, and airways, and, airways casing yeah. and, narrow. and the usual order is the and yeah. um, hmm. the vein goes first, then the artery, and then the airway. All right, this is a quick but fun case. This is a uh, woman who uh, let's see here has a has a GYN cancer, long standing, has been doing fine. And they were trying to access her port, and it wasn't. They weren't getting blood back, so they kept putting in uh, TPA or whatever to try to lyse it, and went, getting nowhere. So this is her old radiograph, and you see at the time she had pleural effusion, nice power port, typical location. And this was her radiograph from yesterday, and we can see that the catheter has separated from the reservoir here, right, kind of where it connects. And it's right where between the first where the first rib passes and the clavicle. So this had been in for five years. This was not a fresh port. So the presumption is it just eventually it broke down, and you can see it actually migrated inferiorly into the inferior right atrium there. So they'll have to fish this out and, and replace it. But an uncommon complication is, is, is a dislocation. But this is where you'll see it. Sometimes the port gets stuck distally. They get a fibrin sheath or something, and if they try to manipulate the other way, it gets stuck as well. Can you show us the initial uh, radiograph again, Jeff? That's really interesting. I'll put them up side by side. I don't know if it lets me show them both. There you go. You can see the connection right here. Okay, let's see. This one, David, is for you. Um, one of my residents had sent me this case. So this is a patient um, who presented with, let me load this up. 
some neurologic issues. And this is some of the MR of the brain. Uh, but this is the post-contrast T1, but you'll notice there's enhancement in the sulci of the uh, cerebellum. But also there's a little bit of enhancement along the sulci of the cerebrum. So this is consistent with a leptomeningitis. I've got some uh, flare images too. Let's see if those are showing. Yeah, so we see some signal changes along the sort of right at the, at the cortical margin there and also in the cerebellum. So it looks like a leptomeningitis. And this is the chest CT, which shows this mass in the right lower lobe displacing the airway. And this is the only abnormality. The patient is from Wisconsin, immune, not immune compromised. And so this was thought potentially to be a metastatic lung cancer um, or some other malignancy. And this uh, nodule was biopsied and grew out cryptococcus. But what's fascinating is that this is a species gadii and not neoformis. And this patient has not been to the Northwest. <clears throat> wow. So I, I dug around a little bit and there are reports from the CDC of cases of gadii outside the Northwest, including east of the Mississippi River in patients who have not traveled there. So, you know, it's an, if I remember, it's a tree fungus. It's probably being carried by birds or other flying critters. Um, so we are, that's now the first case I've seen here outside of, that hadn't been elsewhere. Wow. <clears throat> Wow, it's everywhere now. Yeah, but it looks like any other cryptococcus. I mean, it looks very much with the dominant nodule or nodules in the lung and left a meningeal involvement. Okay, let's wow. see here. Um, here's another fun case that we had this week. So uh, let me pull the original radiograph. So this is a patient who has a cardiac disease and needed a defibrillator. So this was April. This is immediately following or shortly following placement. And we can see the defibrillator has a single lead, terminates in the right ventricle. All looks well. Four months, let's see, four months later, this is the radiograph. And we can see that the, um, I, I somehow I cannot seem to ever display them side by side for you guys, even if I can see them. Uh, but the lead in the right ventricle is migrated more proximally. I'll switch back to the other one just to see that again. You see it was further left of midline. And then on the current, most the one I was showing, it's moved back. The other thing to notice is there's now coiling of the lead near the generator. And then this one radiograph here is from a month, uh, almost a month later. And we see there's even more coils and that's mm. The tip has now migrated probably proximal to the tricuspid valve. So this is a nice twiddler syndrome that occurred within four months of defibrillator placement. What I thought was, was interesting is that the generator itself had not rotated. Because I usually think of them fiddling with the, I've seen cases where the whole generator rotates, the battery, the orientation of that, it had not changed. So maybe just a little bit. So I wonder if, if even if it was just a very subtle uh, fiddling with it that led to this coiling, or it rotated back and it just reduced here in the pocket. Well, the other thing, Jeff, is it could be rotating around the vertical axis. If you draw a vertical axis in this thing, uh -huh. if, if the person is flipping it and it just flips it 180 and then the additional 180, you get this pattern of coiling of the wire. I see. So I think she's probably doing three, good 360s there, and you can't see the rotation of the generator. It's probably the vertical axis that it's rotating around. All right, that makes sense. Yeah, so it backed out. Yeah, haven't seen one of those in a long time. It was kind of fun. Okay, um, this is a cool case. So this is a young man who presented with chest pain, and let me show you the radiograph here. It's not showing, and has a large mass in his chest. And here's the lateral projection. So we can see it's it's an, it's an a prevascular or anterior mediastinal mass. You can see part of the margin right here, but it's really, really big. Young guy, you think about, you know, germ cell tumor, sarcoma, lymphoma, it's, but it's really smooth. Maybe some kind of congenital cyst. 
So a CT that was done somewhere else, and let me, you should, you should see a CT scan, and here's the CT from the outside, and we see this big, big, big mass in the left hemithorax. It's compressing the left ventricle. It seems to be arising from the mediastinum. It's compressing the inferior um, vein. It's compressing the lung. And an important, two important observations is there's a little band of calcium in it. And when I was looking at it today, the PATH report, um, I went back and looked at it again and found this little crescent of fat. And that seems to be separate from the mediastinal fat and thymus here. Uh, I, we have an MR and um, the MR shows there is definitely a cystic component to it, maybe a fluid level. There's also some heterogeneity in it. Uh, this is, uh, let's see here, this is a, um, that's the out of phase. I thought there was an in phase T1. Uh, anyway, um, very cystic, it's got some septations in it. And then we have a multi phase uh, contrast enhancement. There's a little enhancing lung around it, maybe some capsular enhancement and a little bit of enhancement, but overall it's predominantly cystic. So with the fat and calcium, you would think about a, a germ cell tumor of some sort. So this, this thing came out uh, and the surgeon said it was pretty gross, had hair in it and all sorts of like milky liquid in it. There, there's, you can see a nice delayed with some enhancement. So this was all- oh, it's known as sebum. <laughs> yeah. That's not good, probably, maybe. Yeah, so it was a large, cystic teratoma and interestingly you know this is a male they usually have some immature components but the pathology they went through it and couldn't find anything malignant or immature it was fully matured so that's good news for the patient the whole thing's out now um but yeah so just a very complex cystic predominantly cystic with very little soft tissue just a few septates and that one little plug of fat I, all the other ones i've seen have a little bit more soft tissue in them so kind of fun yeah, that's a very nice example. All right, now here, here's one. Okay, so this is the one I sent you guys. Um, but I'm interested to talk about it a little bit. And I've got one more, I don't know what it is kind of case. So this is this patient who has a clinical phenotype that is perfect for IPF. He's got clubbing, he's shortness of breath, crackles, he's 60 something, former smoker, male has all the good things going on. And then this is his CT scan down on the outside. Um, and, you know, I was asked to look at this because he was sent to us with a diagnosis of IPF. And I could see very easily why that happened. You look at the CT, it's got these holes that are basal predominant. Um, but what, what, what took me, what, I, what struck me was, this looks like emphysema up here. Some of it's a little bit finer, but mostly looks like emphysema. And there's a real lack of reticulation. There's actually some ground glass out in the periphery, very subtle. You know, I could chalk all that up to smoking. He's like a 40 pack year smoker. But as I was coming down, I noticed not only was there ground glass, as we started seeing these holes, um, they're bigger than the usual honeycomb cyst. But more importantly, there was no reticulation anywhere. And these airways taper quite nicely. I mean, they pass right through this. I mean, there's a few areas where they get a little, little plump, but it's not your typical traction bronchiectasis. And then uh, there were a couple spots out here where I wish it were a little bit more subplural. And this is probably some, I don't know if it's aspirating or something inflammatory. And then this odd thing here, there's some kind of pleural interface. So I wonder if this is a little bit of lung that's folded up underneath that somehow is spared. Um, and that's what that is. There's some weird fissure and there's just a small remnant of lung that's spared. But I just didn't like this for UIP. And the, the pulmonologist was rather surprised because clinical picture and a CT that looks like this, I could see why this would be a pretty typical UIP. And we talked a little bit about this offline, but the question is, is what exactly is going on in here? Are these real honeycomb cysts? Is this smoking related? These are dilated uh, airways or something else in there. But I'll show the coronal too, because I think the lack of volume loss is important because with, with you know, they, uh, there's several papers that have been published. Some of them are old, but Jeff Galvin quotes them a lot that show that a lot of this honeycombing is collapse of the secondary or, or, the, or just the pulmonary lobules. And so the lungs get smaller, but they don't get denser. But these lungs aren't really that small to this much, quote, fibrosis. So I don't know if you have any other insights. Uh, 
I think when I look at the, the less involved regions, I would accept that it's pathologically uh, honeycombing mm -hmm. away from the lung bases. Um, when I look at the whole the whole data set, the whole case, yeah. Another comment that just came in was airspace enlargement with surrounding fibrosis, which would make some mm -hmm. sense. You know, and David had commented, showed that case last week with the pseudo honeycombing. So I'm wondering if this is a similar phenomenon. And Travis kind of said the same thing. He said when his when when he was at Emory, he would have called this UIP. But you know, working with um, the folks at UCSF, I guess they've seen this phenomenon too, where they would sort of chalking up more smoking related disease. Mm -hmm. So I mean, the thing about the um, the pseudo honeycombing that I showed, I think it was a couple months ago, was uh, that um, it had this bubbly look to it. But there wasn't volume loss, as in, as in this case. And um, when Rod Schmidt got to it, there was very little fibrosis. So it was really these holes in the lung, these cysts in the lung. And they were lined by, they had some ciliary um, epithelium, but they also had smooth muscle in their walls, implying that they were, those cysts were derived from, from airways. And so he really said, this is cystic lung disease, it's not UIP, it's not fibrosis. So it was there, there was the fact that there was very little fibrosis, that there was smooth muscle in the wall, which doesn't go with it, with, um, with pulmonary fibrosis. You can get a ciliary uh, epithelium in, the, in honeycomb cysts, but so that, that wouldn't distinguish it, but the presence of smooth muscle in the case, it was really airway derived. So uh, it does have a lot of similarities with this case. I think the other, uh, the main thing that Jeff is pointing out here is that, again, radiographically, as on the pathology that Rod Schmidt reported, there's fairly little reticulation and a whole lot of holes. So it really doesn't fit with honeycomb cysts deriving, uh, being derived in the presence of lung fibrosis. There's not that much fibrosis here. Well, we usually see the reticulation starting at the top and working its way down, whereas with some of the connective tissue diseases, we often see just stuff at the bases. I mean, most of the IPF cases I've seen, you see something and it just gets worse. I mean, these upper lobes look like there's emphysema and some smoking related, you know, the ground glass is probably a mix of smoking related injury. And so I wonder if this is just some weird variant emphysema. Uh, let's see, someone just sent us a link. Let's see if I can pull it up. And you should be able to see. There you go. I don't know if that's Sudaka in there, but I appreciate the, the comment here. Aerospace enlargement fibrosis, different from UIP. Let's see. Well, I'll have to pull up this article later, but that's interesting. Um, from Tom Colby and group. So interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll find this article and send it along. Okay. And yeah, to move along, this, this is a case I just got a consult on. I'm really curious what you guys think. Um, this is a young woman. I think she's in her early 30s or late 20s and was born in West Africa, but was adopted and came to the U.S. at the age of seven, carries a diagnosis of latent TB, but is otherwise does pretty well and got a CT scan. I'm not exactly sure why um, at an outside facility. And this is what it looks like. So she's got this striking peribronchial I don't know if you want to call them cysts or holes that are mid and upper zone predominant, fairly symmetric. She had a, some skin lesions, but they've been proven to be verrucous warts from HPV, just cutaneous warts. So that's been nothing in the skin. Um, she also has some large, uh, that's the distribution there. I notice, well, I should go back to that coronal because I think there's another important finding because I was wondering if these were airways at first. But it's kind of a similar thing. You don't really have any volume loss. You've got these branching normal looking bronchi and then these striking peribronchial cysts. The fissures have a few small nodules on them, kind of um, like we see with perilymphatic stuff. So it's a, sort of a perilymphatic distribution. And then on her uh, soft tissues, you can see there's, there's very plump. She's got some lymph nodes. They're not, they're a little on the juicy side, but she's got these large bronchial arteries. And you may, that are supplying the lungs. So in the outside, she was called cystic fibrosis, which would be a very unusual in someone 
a native of West Africa, and B, there's no bronchiectasis or, or real obstruction. So you know, with the symmetry distribution and demographics, I was wondering if this is just a bizarre manifestation of sarcoid. But usually with, when I see cystic spaces or what, what's been called honeycombing with sarcoid, there's bronchiectasis, there's volume loss, and I'm just not seeing any of that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not alone then. Well, um, so Jeff, are there any frank, uh, you know, infected looking like TB like cavities in this no, or is it all have this, uh, walls and even TB cavities give you some distortion and thicker walls, right? These are, I mean, this looks like paraseptal lymphosema out here, mm -hmm. but then there's yeah. stuff around. I mean, I mean, some of this even looks like we see with mucinous adenocarcinoma where you get these bubbly walls. Mm -hmm. But I just can't explain this. I have seen people with diffuse paraseptal emphysema that were called sarcoid based on a bronch or something. I mean, but how old is the person right now? She's young. I think she's in her 20s or early 30s. No, no exposures, no occupational exposures, no illicit drugs. Um, no, we can't call it air trapping and invoke something like some weird post-infectious. No. You know, I, I did look. She, Someone at some point said she had a history of juvenile RA, which whatever they call it now, juvenile chronic arth um, arthritis. But she denies it has no symptoms, no bone findings. So that's sort of a suspect diagnosis. But, you know, if you look along the fissure, there are little tiny nodules. So that's why in the distribution, I mean, when I see something this symmetric and upper level, I mean, sarcoid's one, two, and three on my list. And boy, this is a good demographic for it. What about, um, it's a very unusual appearance, but could it even be um, Langerhans cell histiocytosis? Like, um, you no, know, the distribution's pretty weird. Yeah, and with that much stuff, usually they become confluent. They start hyperinflating a little bit. She doesn't smoke. And there's a lot of architecture in there. Um, I'm, I'm, was she ever hospitalized with a, you know, was she ever um, hospitalized with severe respiratory infection or something like that? Could this be post? Could it be? Uh, well, she, uh, she did have a history of H1N1 influenza. Well, maybe this is uh, maybe this is left over from that. I mean, because I've seen some post ICU, you know, some post ARDS people look this messy and this distribution it seems to like mid and upper lungs. Okay, maybe because the lung lobes are atelectatic and they're surgery. So H one N one post post that I think is probably our best our best bet. I was thinking I was trying to turn this into something that looked like severe TB that was actually. A typical mycobacterium infection. I've seen that in some Africans with a lot yeah. of upper lung disease. I, I but it doesn't that ragged. Thicker walls, nodules, something. Right. Else. I I agree, but I like the you know post ARDS, maybe post influenza. That would be that's that okay. the closest. I like that too. I think that would explain a lot of it. And but then, wonder, but then she would have to have a history of of being um, hospitalized, very ill in the ICU, which you. I know she don't. had a severe illness. I don't know of all the details, but I because it's a new consult. But I sus I did see something written about that when you you reminded me of it when you asked, and mm -hmm. the fact they knew she had H one N one means she probably was hospitalized because otherwise it'd just be flu, and no one's gonna try to type it. Or she survived because she was young yeah. and you didn't get to the ICU, but managed to survive anyway, and is left yeah. with you know, basically yeah. post ARDS. Okay, cool. All right. I've got another one, but I'll save it for if we have time or another week. It's kind of interesting, too. All right. Well, either of you guys got some cases? Um, I've got a few. Okay. Let me, um, let me get ready here. Um, Okay, um, can people see a CT scan here? Yeah. 
So Eric, Eric Stern showed me this case this morning. He called from Harbor U to ask me if I had any insight into this. I said, uh, I know a bunch of guys who have insight. And so um, here is this case that he was asking about. This, this is a young man, I think uh, 20s. Uh, he is from El Salvador and he has these unusual plural calcifications. So he's got that big lumpy thing there. He's got something along the right hemidiaphragm and another big ellipse of this stuff on the left, a smaller one down here on the right. And there's a high up one here on the left as well, along the upper mediastinum here. And, and the, um, so the interesting thing is that the lung is unperturbed by these things. So these are really behaving like pearl plaques, which are smooth enough that they don't cause a symphysis of the visceral and parietal pleura, and you don't get wrinkles in the lung, you don't get lung bands or round atelectasis. Now in the bases, there's just a little bit of uh, lung atelectasis associated with these things, but it's quite smooth, really. This one down here has a little uh, bit of a, a little stalk-like radial band to it, and this one down here near the diaphragm has a little bit of reaction near it. But otherwise, these look like pleural plaques, but this is a very young guy. So <clears throat> it doesn't, and you know, there's a history of some drug abuse. I don't know whether there's intravenous drug abuse or not, and I've not had a chance to look at his chart. Um, and um, the lungs look pretty good. So he also has a history of uh, remote tuberculosis. We did find that there's a granuloma in the left base down here, a calcified granuloma, and there's one calcified mediastinal lymph node here, pretty small, back here. I think this little thing back here. But it doesn't look like TB, and it doesn't look like post-TB pleural calcification. So um, it's pretty thick for a pleural plaque. And you know, at, the, at his age of 20, <clears throat> 26 or something like that, he's not had much of a chance to have exposure do you guys have any insight as to this bizarre plural calcification in this young guy? Um, if you go to, can you go to the mediastinal window and zoom up and show us the bigger one in the left basal hemithorax that you had there that looked uh, lenticular in shape? Yeah, let's just have a look at that a second. But because if you scroll, do you get the sense that in the periphery there's almost thickened pleura with punctate calcium? Mm -hmm. And then anterior to it, there's high attenuation calcium, but it's more amorphous-like. Right. And <clears throat> so I was wondering whether one consideration was tal, tal pleurodesis. Could this be tal collections? But that usually causes a lot of stickiness, you know, and you've got, then you get radial bands, round atelectasis, and a whole lot of pleural thickening. So it's really, almost... What well, I was trying to think of, of fluid, like milk of calcium, where the calcium is deposited, but it, within some fluid, because you can get strange, um, with chronic pleural disease in general, you can get strange intrapleural collections that contain fat, mm -hmm. and develop fat. And I wonder if the fat can sometimes have milk of calcium, like calcium in it, mm -hmm. and then, and then, That I one really intrigues me where you have something that is so lenticular shaped. Right. Isn't as punctate as the other areas. Yet yeah. there's plural peripheral to it, adjacent to it, contiguous with it, that's calcified. Um, calcified plaques, bilateral. Oh, uh, calcified things, things bilateral. There's spleen's okay, David. This isn't like calcified splenic tissue. Yeah, it looks fine. Um, okay, well, uh, yeah. you know, Howard, I think you made a very good observation. There are really two two kinds of calcification here. There's the uh, <clears throat> milky stuff anteriorly, and then there's the denser uh, stuff posterior to it. So we have to do a search for tropical diseases in tropical pleura and see if we ever discover something weird like that. Okay. I mean, this is really strange. Okay. <clears throat> wow. Okay. Uh, well, let's go on to something uh, um, more ordinary here.
but uh, if you guys get any more thoughts, let me know. I will relay okay. what you what you said to uh, to Eric. Okay. So here's a guy who um, is who had a stem cell transplant 14 months ago and has graft versus host disease and is uh, getting doses of corticosteroids to control his graft versus host disease. And he showed up with this lung nodule that was not there on a radiograph about two or three weeks before. So a little uh, round thing up here and maybe a little stuff on this other side. <clears throat> and he was uh, CT'd and we have this nice nodule here in the apex. So graft versus host disease, um, you know, in the setting of stem cell transplant 14 months before, uh, neutropenia, and a nodule up here. So we would think first of fungus. <clears throat> and this turns out to be nocardia. So nocardia is on the list for fungal looking nodules and nocardia seems to like upper lungs. So I often see it near the apex. Um, and his risk factor was his neutropenia and his corticosteroids here. So nocardia is on our, on our nodule list. <clears throat> and yeah. around here, cryptococcus too. Cryptococcus is not going to be exclusive, I can tell from Jeff's case. Okay, here's another uh, guy. This um, is a person who has who had a lung adenocarcinoma about two years before. It was treated with chemotherapy, then developed ALL with a genetic rearrangement, and uh, the ALL has relapsed, and we have this uh, middle lobe consolidation here. Here it is anteriorly. And a little while later, there was a CT scan. I think this is um, a couple of days later. And there's this striking middle lobe process here with dense consolidation and this uh, more lacy, uh, lower grade consolidation here. And if I can show you the uh, sagittal view on this, it, um, it seems that we have the, some of the features here of a bird's nest with this dense dense rind here. I think the sagittal better shows the dense rind around this more lacy pattern here in the center. And that always makes yes. people think about um, a mucor or a, you know, rhizopus, some sort of invasive fungus like that. Yes. And that's what this turned out to be. So this was rhizopus infection. So the bird's nest sign, which is the dense <clears throat> the dense periphery and then the lacy um, stuff in the center. So when I, I didn't look at the sagittals when I first saw this, and I didn't realize that there was a complete rind. When I looked at the uh, the cross sections, I was struck that there was a dense central nodule here. And on a previous CT scan a couple of days before this, this nodule was more discrete. And then there was the lower grade stuff out here. And I thought maybe this is an invasive fungus. I thought this was actually a good pattern for mucor. And then I interpreted this as possibly hemorrhage then caused by this adjacent fungal nodule. So this could be aspergillus or mucor and that with that sort of interpretation, this could be hemorrhage associated with it. But the um, sagittal view shows that this is really a, a surrounding rind of density. So it's more like a bird's nest. And so it fits even better with, with rhizobus. And at bronchoscopy, uh, there was not much hemorrhage. There was a little bit of blood here, but nothing like what would be required for this, all this white stuff to be blood. So it was not hemorrhagic. And, um, and Sadakar, you know, tumbled to the bird's nestiness. And uh, he was right that this was uh, rhizopus. Okay. Yeah. And uh, here's, a, here's a fellow with this uh, chest radiograph looking pretty normal. Maybe there's just a little smudge at this point. Um, a couple days later, let's see, that was the 23rd, I think, and then here is the 26th, a few days later, and now there's diffuse ground glass abnormality with upper lung concentration and stuff all goes stuff, some abnormalities that go all the way down, some of which was pre existing, but this ground glassy stuff in, is definitely new. And once again, the sagittal is kind of interesting in the distribution of this sagittal, please. Um, and then it seems, if you look at it through the upper lobes here, it seems to be avoiding the, the edges. So it, the anterior edge is relatively clear and the posterior edge along the fissure is relatively clear. This stuff seems to be sort of centered in the, in the center. And um, I don't know what to make of that, but 
I just noticed that for the first time because I'm really sensitized to sagittals today. Uh, here's the, what the radiograph looked like a couple of days after this, and you can see that there's this diffuse ground glass abnormality. So, you know, differential for upper lung ground glass that comes on fairly suddenly like this to me is a viral infection or pneumocystis. Um, the um, colonologists were skeptical about pneumocystis because they said that it came on so suddenly, the person got sick so suddenly. And um, then when I, you know, when it turns out it actually is pneumocystis pneumonia, this is pneumocystis, this is PJP, with this upper lung concentration, they said, we didn't think that pneumocystis had an upper lung concentration, or they said that when it does have an upper lung concentration, those are the AIDS patients who were receiving prophylaxis with inhaled pentamidine. But, uh, you know, my uh, pneumocystis experience goes way back before HIV and AIDS, and it's always had an upper lung concentration, even before people were being treated with pentamidine. So the upper lung concentration doesn't go with um, pentamidine, it goes with pneumocystis itself. And the other thing is that I, I've seen patients way back in the, in the early, um, in, in chemotherapy patients in the early 80s, who would come in short of breath and they had absolutely normal chest radiographs and two days later they had florid disease like this with a sudden onset, uh, which made the, the pulmonologist uh, skeptical about pneumocystis in this case, was familiar to me from seeing those earlier patients. So pneumocystis can involve upper lungs. It doesn't require inhaled pentamidine to generate that and it can come on very suddenly and the people can have go from a normal radiograph to a very abnormal radiograph almost overnight. So somebody who has symptoms of shortness of breath in precede, with preceding any radiographic findings should be suspected. You know, new assistance is on the list of suspects for them. Yeah, David, so, that, that's actually well described because the with HIV, they tend to have a slower onset because what happens is as their CD4 count is slowly falling, the new assist right. begins to start proliferating. Whereas that's the, right chemotherapy, leukemic patients, they tend to become neutropenic rather, or I should say T-cell deficient rather quickly. And so right. cystis is, is, once they become infected with it, multiplies rather quickly. Yeah, so for me, that was a bit of a surprise that the HIV people could have symptoms that went back, you know, you know three, four, even six weeks when they had pneumocystis because it was a, a, a sort of a subacute presentation because I was used to the more acute presentation of the and very to, patients. Yeah. And to my knowledge, the only thing that has been suggested, and it's not great evidence between HIV and non-HIV, is the presence of cystic spaces in the areas of lung disease. Right. Um, and I, yeah. my suspicion, because, I mean, we don't see much pneumocystis around here anymore, but my suspicion is because it was more prolonged, because a lot of the, you see more with the long-standing pneumocystis where they start developing the, the pneumatoceles or whatever we want to call them. It's just because they their their symptoms are more progressive. The process has been going on. These people get imaged right from the get go, or immediately put on treatment. It doesn't ever get to that point mm -hmm. because it's the same biology. It's the same organism, and the reason they get infections is because their T cells don't work. It's just how fast those T cells are depleted. So the host response is uh, probably there's some host response when you have a few T cells and eventually you seek medical care and you may have little holes in your lung by then because it's been brewing, as you said, for six weeks. Right. So the other, the other um, misunderstanding that goes with uh, AIDS era is, and you know, the, the finding of cysts in the lung is that people assume that the organism was named pneumocystis name comes from the fact that when you get pneumocystis pneumonia, you can get some cysts in your lung if you have HIV. But, um, the pneumocyst, the organism was named for its appearance under the microscope. It looks like little holes. It looks like little cysts, and not because it generates cysts in the in the lung. So there's <laughs> all sorts of misunderstanding that came about because of the concurrence of pneumocystis pneumonia and people with HIV. Okay, yeah. excellent. Okay. All right, Howard. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, this is an interesting uh, case. Let me just put up the comparison on the uh, left and the acute presentation on the right. And looking on the right, when this person is acutely ill in the emergency room, you can see why he's got a new bilateral process. Um, the opacities are ill-defined, they're confluent, they're multifocal, multilobar. Um, inflation of the lungs is diminished. This is a young person. Everything else looks fine, but the lung disease is quite apparent. And let me show you, before I give you any history or anything, just to see what this looks like. So I'm not sure that he really needed this. So the time between the chest radiograph and the CT is just a short period of time the next day. And this will give you a flavor for what these opacities look like on CT. So here they are confluent, interestingly quite peripheral here, ground glass, consolidative, mixture of ground glass and consolidative. Let me actually bring up the thins to show you that he also has mild interstitial lung edema as well but quite mild. Let me see. I thought I saw a few septal lines here and there, maybe a little bit of subpleural edema related to the interlobar fissures, and maybe a few peribronchial fluid cuffs. Let me have a look. So perhaps down here, if you ignore the motion and sharpness, you can see some septal lines. So there's some interstitial edema, but otherwise he's got this diffuse, interesting process. So if this is a non-infectious consolidation, you can get out your list of all the causes of an acute illness, but a non-infectious consolidation. So you want to know about eosinophils and so on. But of course, what people usually sometimes ask later on is, oh, why don't you tell me about the history? What was happening with this guy? And of course, that's where the, the diagnosis is. So I'll leave the CT up. And let me, before I show you that, you can see here the history. So a firefighter, they had a drill. So they had to drill with something called simulated smoke that has a mineral oil base without wearing a respirator. And not only he, but all his colleagues got sick, but he got really sick. So I found this on the internet, sorry. So this is acute lung injury, inhalational injury from smoke simulants. They're different kinds. And in the interest of time, I won't go through this, but I'll send that to you. But you can get this on the, on the internet. And you can see there, there's, there's a discussion about mineral oil, mist, and so on and so forth. So of course, they're warning you, don't do this kind of thing, but I guess they did it. So an interesting case of acute inhalational injury. And he did okay. He was lucky. Did he respond? Did they treat him with steroids, Howard, or did it just go away on its own? I don't think so. I think he got better quite quickly. I think he's gone already, gone home. It, very, it looks very organizing pneumonia-like. Yeah, I think this or is all going to get better. Yeah, what I needed. Yep, an acute lung injury, basically. Yeah. And some leaky capillary boot. That's cool. Yeah, quite important. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> So yeah, all he needed was to. So Howard, how do you account for the distribution given that this is something inhaled and should be deposited centrally? Do you think that the pages uh, have moved the stuff out to the periphery? I wonder how, how many days this was after his exposure. Um, it said uh, three nights ago. Okay. I don't know why the distribution is uh, three days ago, I guess, or something. Yeah, three nights ago. I don't know. No idea why it looks that way. You know, if you usually you think that you think, oh, maybe this is a form of eosinophilic pneumonia, but no, I don't know why. It's just curious. Cool. Don't know oh. what to make of it. So it's a mystery. It's a mist oil mystery. Mystery. Yeah. It's a, yeah. So history and physical acute case. Uh, let's see. I'm going to show you. Oh, here is a a very nice case of. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis associated disease. So the chest radiograph looks rather impressive. Perhaps there is a little hyperinflation. This is in August of 2016. Let me bring up the thins and I'll scroll through there and take a look at 
the lungs. I hope it's going to show up, but there is a pattern of mosaic attenuation with the emphasis on low attenuation rather than the higher attenuation. And if you start to look at airways, we see bronchial wall thickening. And actually, as we go down, the lungs get blacker. And I hope you can see there is mosaic attenuation, but there's a lot of air trapping, bronchial wall thickening down here, and mosaic attenuation. And that is the dominant finding by far. And let me see, oh, I do have the uh, expiration. So let's see, I hope this shows it nicely. So let's look at, say, an image like that. There's some air trapping in the lungs here, there and there. Let's have a look at down here. I think down here we have extensive air trapping, severe air trapping diffuse in the lower lung zones. Let's just have a look up here. Sometimes I think if you get a lot of air trapping, you, the mosaic attenuation is hard to pick up and you have to, you have to look at the, the bronchi and the overall lung volumes and so on. So this person does have obstructive lung disease. Let me show you, let's see if, um, I've got a MINIP image here and I'm trying to decide if I did that because I wanted to try and bring out the, the blackness. This may not show very well, but this is what a MINIP image looks like. But there's certainly findings, particularly down here, of overinflation and see where the interlobe fissures are and there's a lot of air trapping. So this patient has rheumatoid arthritis. I'm not sure why they did, but they did an open lung biopsy and really to not my surprise, we have findings of pathologically follicular bronchiolitis, but also a constrictive bronchiolitis component. Let's have a look there. Some of the terminal airways have an increase in mural smooth muscle, constrictive bronchiolitis. But I thought that, um, that the imaging is, is very striking myself. And I thought very consistent with severe constrictive bronchiolitis actually. Unfortunately, I didn't remember to get your PFTs for you. But certainly that can occur in, in uh, rheumatoid arthritis. All right. Let me not show you that one. Let me go to this one. This one, I wish uh, Travis was here because uh, he and I and, and David, everyone likes this kind of case, but let me show you the, um, this case. The emphasis here is on anatomy. So I'll just give you a moment to look at that. And it's a nice teaching case for what I'll show you in a moment. So we have abnormal, mediastinal contours. I prefer to call them interfaces. I'll get into that in a moment. But let me bring up a comparison exam and put that one alongside. So when you look at the two, clearly there is an abnormality. And what I want to show on this one over here is this particular interface right here. So right here is an interface between the left upper lobe and mediastinum. And that interface, which is right here, should be here normally. So the lung is being pushed away. So anatomically, that is sometimes called the aortopulmonic pleural reflection. And the interface itself is here. And if I'll bring up a lateral to go along with that. And you can see there's lymph node enlargement. But if you see that interface right there, then the area of abnormality is right here in front. So the aortopulmonic window is here between aorta and left pulmonary artery. But the aortopulmonic reflection over aorta and main pulmonary artery is here. So the abnormality is left paraaortic disease in the anterior chest. And here you'll see the distribution of the lymph nodes, but it's the abnormality here para-aortic that produces that finding. And this is uh, presumed to be sarcoidosis or is sarcoidosis. And then I will show you just in follow-up the anatomy again to show you that this interface, as the lymph nodes get smaller, that interface is beginning to go back to where it should be and should belong 
which is about here, over here. It's still abnormal, but at least it's going in the right direction. And you can see the lymph nodes elsewhere, hyalur, right paratracheal, are also diminishing. So a really nice example of that interface. Hey, how? Right. This is. It also looks like on the, the abnormal radiograph that you've lost both companion shadows of the clavicles, and you can almost see what looks like enlarged supraclavicular. Up here? Yeah. Oh, that's a good observation. I didn't notice that or didn't pay attention to that. But, and right up here. And you see on the other side, yeah. on the no, newer radiograph, the companion shadows came back. Oh, that's a lovely observation. Let's see if we catch the... Okay, the timing, let's see what the timing is. Uh, this is March and here is April. So what should we catch that area? But I wonder if the nodes are starting to get better and they were much more bulky maybe up here. Yeah, maybe, I don't that. know. Or maybe we're getting fooled by something else. I don't really know. But your observation is these things, right? Right. And the companion nodes and so on. Yeah. Is this a boy or a girl? This is a guy? Uh, yeah. So it's not it's not a hair artifact. It's not a big braid hanging down. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, on the lateral view of your abnormal uh, chest radiograph, there's another finding of lymphadenopathy, and that's absence of the the posterior wall of the bronchus intermedius. Yes. Yes. So, right. So you don't have a thin white line that you right. can track below the right or below. Right. Yeah. So we have hyalur and subcarinal. Right lymph node enlargement as well. Yes, he's got a lot of nodes in those locations. And the correlation for that observation, well, it's it's the nodes right in here mm -hmm. that can prevent the lung from contacting the posterior wall of bronchus intermedius, or at least produce the opacity and the effacement of the so-called intermediate stem line right in here. Yeah, very good. Yeah, exactly. So some nice anatomy, nice teaching case for anatomy. Uh, this one's really quick. It's just a case of, unfortunate case of, a nice demonstration of metastases from, as I'll show you in a moment, an osteosarcoma. So let's see if I have the one that shows the calcified nodules very well. Let's go back to maybe that one. So we have nodules in the lungs. And then of course, if you look at the nodules, there's variable amount of calcium or bone associated with some of these. Let's see if I can find others. I haven't looked at this case in a while, but a number of these, for example, down here, are associated with calcium and or bone from the sarcoma, as you see there. So just a reminder of about calcified nodules in that context. Oh, you know, this one is interesting. Let me just go back to the thin cuts to see if that one actually is potentially tumor growing in a, if I have thin cuts, which I may not, actually growing in a vessel. So if we go back up here, well, I can't tell for sure there is some calcium associated with it, but hard to say, actually. It looks like one anyway, of the ones in the lower lobe on the right were also branching. Maybe intravascular metastases. Yeah, you, you see a couple of... I thought you showed... See that one, kind of, that one down medially near the uh, spine? Yeah, not the right. Phenomenon. It bifurcates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it may be growing in a vessel. Watch it branch. I mean, it branch it here. Yeah, and it's of high attenuation. Yeah. It may well be. I bet you're right. That in. Yeah, if you do that. So, yeah, unfortunately, pulmonary metastases from that tumor. All right, Jeff, that <laughs> should take us to one o'clock, my time. Thank you, everybody. We will uh, have a good trip, Howard. We'll see you in a few weeks. All right. We're, we're going. What's your trip? Thanks.